the cyborg head does a reasonable job of sensing. It can't really interact with or explore its surroundings. It's fastened to its robot arm. And according to Kevin, it's only as intelligent as a dishwasher. If that's a dishwasher, yes. What, where are these in terms oh. of that? Are they dolphins, chimps? I, I think you'd have to say uh, it's about the 50 to 100 brain cell area. So realistically, you're talking slugs and snails. But a slug and a snail, they know to eat. They know these things well, don't. They have some innate abilities. There's no self-preservation with that. Well, we do have this, this, the power supply. They don't have their own batteries. They each have power they're picking up from the floor here. That's where they're getting their, their energy. That's where they're getting their food. But if you turned off this section of the, of the, of the floor, if we turn off this section, was here, they have a basic instinct to go and look for some power somewhere they else. They will there. keep going to do that until they find some. So if I put him down, it should go off. So we'll have to go and look for yeah. power. Are they going to tell him to do that? No, it's, it's an innate response for that robot. It's a basic thing of its life. Yeah, yeah. No, his lights have come back on. Lights have come on. So he's found power. He's happy now that he's getting power away to go. But these, then, are as intelligent as slugs. It is different, but in terms of numbers of brain cells and that sort of thing, yeah, we have slugs. Probably you could say we're up to bees and wasps, the sort of tens of thousands of brain cells, is about as good as you can get. Yeah. Bees and wasps, yeah. right. <laughs> Um, oh, the, the original quote there, if you check on Wikipedia, is that our robots have 50 to 100 brain cells, which is about the same as a slug or a snail or a Manchester United supporter. Um, <laughs> but the BBC didn't like that last bit. So. Uh, those robots, though, that we just looked at, uh, they have a computer, a microprocessor controlling them. We can still, we can get them communicating, infrared, they can send signals, they can learn, they can teach each other, they can do all sorts of things like that. So we can investigate that. But we have most recently replaced the computer brain of the robot by a biological brain. So the physical part of the robot, with the wheels, with the body, with the sensory input, the ultrasonic sensors in that case, with a good sense of distance, that's ex exactly the sort of thing you were looking at, the physical side of the robot. However, um, the brain, the thinking mechanism, is now a biological neural network. Uh, this is a multi-electrode array, an array of electrodes that we actually grow a brain on top of. And we can send signals to it, uh, which stimulate it. The brain will then do its thinking and will output signals which we use to drive the wheels of the robot around. So the brain has a motor output and a sensory input. We get the neurons from uh, rat embryos. Uh, this is the, the multi-electrode array. So we culture, we grow the brain in there. At the present time, it's a two-dimensional brain. Uh, we lay it down within about... First, first of all, we separate the neurons using enzymes. We then lay it down. Within 20 minutes or so, the enzymes are putting out tentacles that ultimately become the dendrites and the axons, the inputs and the outputs to the, uh, to the neurons. Um, we are looking here at typical numbers, 100,000 neurons. So it's quite a bit more than we've been looking at with the other robots. Um, the human brain has 100 billion, so we're talking 100,000 to 100 billion, but it, it, 100,000 is a respectable number. So we can <coughs> stimulate it, and uh, from another point we get an output in response to that stimulation that initially is, is sort of not repetitive all the time, it's not like a program thing, some of the time it will respond how we would like it to, some not, but we connect it to the robot body. So what we can do with the robot is take a sensory signal, stimulate the brain, and hope that it responds in a way that drives the robot around. So what we're trying to achieve uh, is to get the robot, in this simple example, to drive around in the corral without bumping into the wall. So if you haven't seen a robot with a biological brain before, this, this is what you're seeing now. These are its ultrasonic sensors. It will come up to the wall, it will detect the wall, and then it moves away from it. 
So that's what it's supposed to do. Then you see it, it changed direct. That wasn't what it's supposed to do. And then it was supposed to, it didn't move away from the wall. So what this robot is, is like a baby robot, mentally. Um, it's about 10 days old, it's <coughs> starting. When a, a, a human baby is learning to walk, that's what this robot is doing now. It's just starting to get to grips with its environment. So again, the only thinking mechanism of this robot is a, is a biological, is the brain that we have grown. And for the brain, the only body that it's got sensory input and motor output is the robot body. It, it doesn't have a biological body. Um, the way this research is heading, what we're trying to do is to put the robot in particular positions and to see how the memory of those positions actually manifests itself in the brain. How does the memory of being in that corner, what to do with that corner, how does it appear in the brain in terms of the neural connections? Because things in humans, things like Alzheimer's disease it is a problem with memory, with neurons dying off. But what exactly is the problem? Is it that the memory is lost? Is it that the, the retrieval mechanism, the passageways, there's a problem? Is it the neurons that are controlling the retrieval? What exactly is the problem? We don't know. And hopefully with this we can learn, which will help with medical research. Um, the, the two other things to say where this is heading uh, immediately is we're working with a group in Canada now that culture, that grow the neurons in three dimensions. So we're now building up to culture in three dimensions. That will give us not 100,000 neurons, but something like 30 million neurons. Now that's getting a reasonable size. You're up, literally, you're getting into cats and dogs. I, and, and hence, one of the <coughs> things we're worried about, the sensory input, this is just pretty simple ultrasonic sensors, is probably not stimulating enough for the brain. So I have a student working on audio input and audio output. So we're looking to start communicating with the robot, you know, give it a whistle or a noise or a shout, and maybe it can respond to us, tell us uh, where, you know, what, is, what is the thing, help me, or something like that from the, uh, how, what is going to, uh, noise is it going to make, we'll, we'll see. So that's opened up the whole communicating with the thing. The other thing is, was reported in New Scientist recently that we are now starting to use human neurons. Now, they are a little bit more difficult to culture. Not too much different, though. Um, and we're not so much looking at the differences between rat neurons and human neurons, but more the whole principle that we could potentially be growing uh, a brain that is controlling the robot that has 30 million neurons that... Uh, is based on human brain cells. And when you start increasing that, to say, okay, we've not got 30 million, but we've got 1 billion or 10 billion, then you start, well, hold on a minute. If we now compare that with a human brain, you know, your brain has 100 billion. If this thing has, say, 50 billion, uh, should it have rights? Um, should, should I be able to switch it off? Or, or should you say, no, you can't switch Or should it be able to switch me off? Or uh, should it have voting rights? Or what, how, how do we treat it? And if it has voting rights, could I build 6,000 of these and make sure somebody else gets elected? At the, you know, how, how, how can we deal with that? So it, it's opening up all sorts of questions, maybe what it means to be a human uh, as well. So that's ongoing research and uh, opening up a few questions. Um, a lot of the cyborg research uh, is more based on medical help and assistance, either rehabilitation or therapy, helping people that have problems or another. Now, in that sense, we can try and, this is using EEG, electroencephalograph uh, information, electrodes on the scalp to try and pick up what's going on inside um, to try and pick up indications or early symptoms of stroke or uh, things like that. Uh, it can also be used potentially to get an idea of what you're trying to do, what you're thinking about doing. You have